Great, thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. It's been very uh, informative for me so far. And hopefully we'll have a, a good discussion afterwards. So uh, just to remind you, CLL, of course, is the most common uh, leukemia uh, in the US. And I'm sure you've all heard a lot of chatter about MRD assessment, particularly in CLL. So uh, I'm simply asking the question, is, is there a role for measuring MRD in CLL in, in clinical practice? Um, you've seen this slide uh, uh, in our first presentation, and it's actually taken from uh, patients uh, with ALL, but I think it, it, it nicely shows that uh, not all MRD is, is the same. There's uh, disease that we can quantify, we can measure and quantify. There's disease that we can detect, but we can't actually quantify. And then there's, of course, uh, the bottom of the pyramid, which is non-detectable disease, which may still be disease. We just don't have the methodology to, to measure that uh, if, it, if it exists. So when, when is a patient truly negative? I don't think we'll ever uh, answer that question with specific testing, but hopefully um, the approaches we're, we are using will uh, allow us to recognize, in particular, when patients are at risk of truly having residual disease. Uh, you've also heard a lot about the technologies, uh, multi-parameter flow cytometry. In CLL, this has long been studied, uh, rigorously studied, uh, by um, uh, cooperating groups both in North America and in, and in Europe. Uh, and so there's a really well-defined, well-validated methodology with flow. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. It's actually been nicely simplified uh, in CLL and I think easily uh, performed in uh, most clinical laboratories. Uh, there's uh, real-time PCR. Aaron talked about this uh, quite a bit in ALL. And I would just emphasize that um, for routine clinical practice, it's, it's really not practical. It's very expensive, laborious you're not really gonna get real-time results, usually. So uh, certainly if you want to do something like this in CLL, in a research study, and collect samples and analyze them at the end of the study, uh, that would be one approach, but um, we really don't uh, use this methodology in, in CLL. And then, of course, there's next-generation sequencing, uh, and as you've uh, seen, in, uh, particularly in ALL, it certainly lends itself quite nicely to lymphoid disease, um, in, including in, in CLL. Also uh, emphasizing again that um, MRD assessment is time and treatment dependent. I can't overemphasize that. Um, particularly true in ALL, of course, you have uh, multiple courses of therapy, multiple courses of different types of therapy, depending on the regimen that you're using. And so whether when you measure MRD post-induction or post-consolidation or, or after maintenance, uh, you get different results and you have to interpret them in that context. Uh, with CLL, not so much of the issue uh, in that uh, if you have a uh, time-limited therapy, you measure at the end of treatment, for, for example. So this doesn't come up uh, as, uh, uh, as much as it does, say, in ALL. But I'll also emphasize that um, MRD negativity is not necessarily the same as eradication of disease. So it, it really tells us something very specific at very specific time points with, um, with specific regimens. So we do have guidelines uh, for MRD assessment uh, in CLL. These are the IWCLL guidelines. And uh, the major point is that uh, the guidelines say we should use these in clinical trials that are assessing the depth of response in clinical trials. We do not advocate using MRD testing in routine cl clinical practice. Uh, now, for savvy practitioners who are heavily involved in CLL, there certainly might be circumstances where you'll choose to, to use MRD assessment for individual patients, for individual reasons, but um, we're not advocating using this in your routine practice. However, it's very important to understand what this information is telling us in the context of cl our clinical trials, because I think that will inform us 
about how to manage our patients in the future, particularly with the novel agents. We should report the sensitivity of the assay, and in CLL, 10 to the minus fourth, uh, as in ALL, I think is, is, a, is well validated as uh, an important level of sensitivity. Whether greater sensitivity uh, can add additional information, I think remains investigational. Report the tissue source, are you using peripheral blood or bone marrow? And importantly, I think, report the proportion of MRD undetectable patients on an intent to treat basis, not just uh, uh, those patients who achieved response or responded to treatment, not just those patients who achieved CR. Let's deal with the real world. You start treatment on someone, how well do you do? Um, of course, sometimes it is nice to know in that patient has a CR how well they're going to do, but you know, you're making a decision at the start of treatment, and so we should apply this to uh, all of our patients that we're studying in the trials. So let's look at MRD assessment in CLL flow cytometry versus next generation sequencing. So of course, in the old days, you had four color flow. That's pretty much the limits of our technology, you know, and that you can use for diagnostic uh, flow, for example, but that's not uh, M, uh, MRD flow. Uh, early on, we used multiple tubes, I think four tubes, uh, multiple antibodies. What about those patients who got rituximab, who downregulate CD20? We have to have a panel that is valid that doesn't have CD20. But fortunately, through some very nice work, largely led by Andy Rostron in the UK and, and this, uh, this uh, group that's uh, cooperating on this, we've uh, come up with both six uh, marker and eight marker panels. Uh, and here I'm showing uh, uh, the results with a six marker core panel on the x-axis is really the expected number of, of CLL uh, leukocytes. You're doing serial dilutions, for example. And then on the y-axis is uh, those using uh, the measurement of the CLL patients using this MRD uh, panel. And uh, the the boxes that are filled in represent those that have detectable and measurable disease. Uh, the light-colored boxes uh, represent those who have um, detectable disease but not measurable, and then uh, the, the unfilled boxes represent those where it's not detectable. And so you can see quite nicely that you get with six markers sensitivity down to 10 to the minus four. I could show you something similar with uh, eight uh, uh, antibodies and probably pushing things down to 10 to the minus five. But this is all done in one tube um, with standard antibodies, something that can be achieved probably in almost all routine clinical labs with the technology that currently exists, the number of lasers, uh, et cetera. Uh, and again, one tube, so we avoid some of the problems with uh, having adequate samples, uh, having to collect more and more um, cells, for example. Now, we also have next generation sequencing. You've heard about Clonaseq, which is uh, FDA approved for ALL myeloma. It's not uh, approved for CLL, but certainly uh, one can uh, understand how it's easily uh, applicable or used in this setting. Uh, and so what this shows is uh, the, the example with uh, Clonaseq. Uh, these are three different samples, uh, and uh, the, the uh, lightly shaded ones are, represent a productive sequence that's been monitored. The empty boxes are a non-productive sequence, and then the filled boxes are an average of those. So if you simply focus on the filled boxes, you can see as you um, decrease the number of, of uh, lymphocytes, you still get a uh, nice measurement. And so this will get you a sensitivity down to about 10 to the minus six, one in a million cells, with this, the caveats that you've heard previously that you have to collect an adequate number of cells. So uh, a highly um, a sensitive assay, and of course the question is, what's the relevance of having something that that's sensitive? Uh, and then finally, this shows a correlation between uh, the, the six antibody uh, flow cytometry uh, MRD assessment versus the uh, clonaseq. Uh, and if you focus in this, cat, in this box here, uh, this is looking at now down to 10 to the minus fourth, for example, and you can see most of the samples uh, 
really fall in this, whether it's above the uh, limit of quantitation or below the limit of detection. Uh, so there's a nice correlation uh, between flow cytometry in this case and the uh, clonoseq assay. Now here's an example of uh, a report uh, from a patient that you might get using this uh, particular assay. Uh, and as I mentioned, we do see good concordance with flow cytometric uh, MRD assessment at 10 to the minus fourth sensitivity, and we see a good linearity with this uh, a high throughput sequencing down to a limit of one in the million. So this is a patient, uh, these are the different uh, sequences that have been identified as being uh, in this patient, including the dominant sequence here. This is at time of uh, before treatment, fresh bone marrow, uh, and uh, almost a, a million copies. And then this is a year later, um, after uh, com actually combined therapy, in this case with the brutinib and venetoclax, and you can see it's uh, reduced substantially, although still detectable. Uh, and similarly, looking at some of the other uh, immunoglobulin sequences. Uh, importantly, uh, these reports uh, contain lots of quality control information, so I think it's, it's asking quite a lot of us as clinicians to uh, really dig down and interpret uh, the, the data or at least the, uh, the quality of the data, and that's why I think any good laboratory should provide that data and also provide an explanation, such as the amount of DNA collected for this particular assay was below uh, standard and therefore it limits the sensitivity. This is an example of, uh, from that same report of looking at quality control, telling you what the limit of detection of the assay is and what the limit of quantitation is for this particular patient. So you can use these numbers and, and see immediately that uh, what we measured in this patient after a year of therapy is, is relevant. It's, it's, uh, it's persistent uh, detectable disease uh, because it's not below uh, these levels. So how do we apply this now to the therapies that we use? And let's start with chemoimmunotherapy. So with CLL, of course, we have standard responses we call a complete response and a partial response. So why do those response definitions exist? It's because they make a difference with chemoimmunotherapy. If you give somebody BR or FCR, for example, and they achieve less than a CR, they are not going to do well. And that is clear. And so that's why those uh, definitions exist. Now, that's changing with our novel therapies because of the, the way they work, but it does point out that um, our response uh, definitions mean something. So what about uh, a response definition based on uh, MRD? And here we're talking about MRD flow, uh, 10 to the minus fourth sensitivity. This is a very nice uh, recent publication looking at a meta-analysis. And it's looking at individual trials here. Uh, and all these trials are familiar to you. These are the FC versus FCR. These are the BR versus FCR. These are the corambacil obinutuzumab trials all of the, the, the trials uh, for which there's uh, data, MRD measurement, and uh, it's summarized here on the left. Uh, those patients who have undetectable MRD uh, do much better in terms of progression-free survival compared to detectable MRD. Uh, so the, on these forest plots, the uh, vertical lines here, you can see this is about uh, und about 80%, I think, so at 36 months, that gets you about up to there. So this is three-year PFS. So MRD makes a difference in terms of progression-free survival. In fact, it's fair to say that it's the single best predictor of PFS with most of these chemoimmunotherapy regimens. Uh, better than our traditional response criteria of CR or PR. Overall survival as well. You can see with the same kind of analysis, uh, there's overall survival data from some of these trials. Uh, and again, you have your forest, forest plots here. You can see that undetectable MRD, the three-year overall survival, is superior to what you see in patients who achieve, who don't achieve uh, undetectable MRD. <clears throat> 
Now, doing what I said you shouldn't do, which is taking your subset of patients who uh, achieve a CR, but let's look at those patients specifically, because those are the ones who traditionally do the best uh, with chemoimmunotherapy. Uh, Progression-free survival in the CR patients is also influenced by MRD flow st status here. You can see uh, undetectable versus detectable. Um, however, overall survival uh, is, is uh, not influenced in patients who achieve uh, CR. So uh, very convincing body of data showing that MRD assessment is highly prognostic of uh, progression-free and, and overall survival in, in many cases with our standard chemoimmunotherapy regimens. What about antibody therapies? Because of course we use anti-CD20 antibodies in a lot of our chemoimmunotherapy. So here is a, a, a longer follow-up and an uh, MRD assessment uh, from the obinutuzumab uh, chlorambicil versus rituximab uh, chlorambicil trial. Remember, that's the one that demonstrated that the addition of obinutuzumab is superior to the use of rituximab in terms of progression-free uh, survival. And one can also break this down by MRD uh, assessment. We all know that rituximab doesn't do a particularly a good job of targeting the bone marrow in contrast to obinutuzumab, so you're more likely to be able to achieve an MRD undetectable status using the second generation anti-CD20 antibody. Uh, and so there is a striking difference. This is the arm of patients who received obinutuzumab uh, and chlorambicil and are uh, undetectable uh, MRD. Uh, the rest of these are all the other subgroups, those who uh, were not MRD undetectable or those who received uh, rituximab rather than obinutuzumab. So when you look at the subgroup analysis of this trial, uh, the survival benefit of anti-CD20 therapy is primarily in the undetectable MRD subgroups. And uh, here's the overall survival uh, from that same study, which again uh, shows that uh, MRD status post-treatment is uh, highly prognostic in terms of uh, overall survival. Here's your MRD undetectable patients. Well, we're now in the era, hopefully, of novel therapies. Hopefully, we're not using chemoimmunotherapy, so we need to understand how uh, this applies to our patients. And one trial we can turn to is the Murano study. You saw um, uh, some data on this in our first presentation. Just to remind you, this is venetoclax rituximab versus Bendamustine rituximab for previously treated CLL patients. Uh, it's an example of a time-limited regimen in that the venetoclax was given for two years, along with six months of rituximab. And so this is looking at end of treatment. Um, so the progression-free survival after end of treatment by MRD status. And again, to, to orient you here, uh, so the, the blue uh, is the VEN-R patients who were undetectable uh, MRD at the end of the treatment. And in contrast, this is the bendamustine rituximab who are MRD positive. But again, this, uh, if you go across here, uh, and look at the groups that do the best. They're the ones who achieve the deepest response. If you look solely at the BR patients, uh, those who did the best were those who had the deepest response. Uh, same is true with the, the VEN-R patients. And if you compare uh, the two groups to each other, uh, the, the Ven uh, venetoclax rituximab arm was superior uh, across the board to the uh, BR patients. Uh, so now uh, an example with one of our novel agents, one that we know uh, targets the bone marrow well and that can achieve undetectable uh, MRD, even actually as a, as a single agent. So uh, looking at this in a little more detail over time, here's your BR patients. So I'll have you focus on the, the blue, which is undetectable MRD, and then uh, the so-called low uh, MRD, almost undetectable, right above that. So with uh, BR, this is at the end of six months, so at the end of treatment, and then some patients achieve that, but they rapidly have easily detectable disease as they're followed out. Uh, in VEN-R, remember the rituximab ends here, uh, but the uh, venetoclax continues for two years, so you, see, you achieve undetectable 
uh, MRD in a large proportion of patients uh, and at early time points. In fact, it's, it's kind of interesting to see that over time, uh, even though you're continuing on the venetoclax, you're not necessarily uh, achieving a, a greater proportion of patients with uh, undetectable uh, MRD. Uh, of course, what will be interesting and, and some data you'll hear at this meeting is further follow-up of this study, uh, patients two years off of therapy now in general, what's happening with them both clinically uh, in terms of progression-free survival and what's happening in terms of uh, MRD responses. Uh, one other study uh, that I'll, I'll bring up is also in the relapse setting. This is the Clarity uh, uh, study from the UK. And here, actually, the primary endpoint was to achieve uh, undetectable MRD as uh, defined by our standard 10 to the minus fourth in the bone marrow after 12 months of the combined uh, regimen of abrutinib and venetoclax. And without going into a lot of details from this uh, trial, it's quite interesting because they're also, also looking at the kinetics of MRD. How quickly is it achieved? And they're using that uh, to apply how long they continue treatment for in individual patients. Uh, but you can see just as a top line here, uh, at month 14, so after uh, two, 12 months of combination with a two-month lead-in with a brutinib alone, you have a 40%, a 39% bone marrow MRD undetectable, which is quite good in this uh, uh, previously treated population. Um, here's a, a particularly poor prognostic group, uh, patients who got standard chemoimmunotherapy and progressed within three years, but they had a very nice response uh, as well. And again, looking over time, uh, up to month 26, uh, they measured down to 10 to the minus fourth MRD, which is, uh, gets you the uh, light green. Uh, they used a, a sensitivity flow down to 10 to the minus fifth, which is the dark green. So if you, if you combine those two and, and uh, look over time, here's your abrutinib lead-in. And then as you continue the combination therapy, in this case, you're getting um, continued improvement over time. Not many patients out quite this far yet, but high proportions of patients, both in the peripheral blood and in the bone marrow, who are achieving MRD undetectable. And then again, I'll refer you to a very recent publication, and this is sort of a summary, if you will, of a lot of trials done with both a chemoimmunotherapy, but also the novel agents, um, looking at the degree of undetectable uh, MRD that can be achieved with uh, these sorts of combinations, uh, both in the uh, peripheral blood, which is the light-colored uh, bars, and when it's been measured in the bone marrow. And so uh, chemoimmunotherapy is, is grouped over here. For example, chlorambucil, Endobinotuzumab in the peripheral blood, you're up a little over 30%. Um, and any of the novel combinations that we're using push it up very much higher. So uh, as with chemotherapy regimens, the deeper the response, the longer the progression-free survival we see with our novel agents and our novel combinations. Uh, so uh, Abrutinib plus venetoclax in the upfront setting, published this year uh, from MD Anderson. These are previously untreated patients, and after 12 months of therapy, you get a very high uh, rates of MRD undetectable. Uh, and we'll have an update at this meeting uh, for further follow-up and also to see whether an additional year of combined treatment uh, adds benefit. Does it improve upon this? So in summary, I think... Um, MRD flow as an endpoint is a, a, a strong marker for progression-free survival with chemoimmunotherapy. Next generation sequencing is, is quite interesting to explore in, in CLL and is being done in trials, but it remains investigational. Is that additional sensitivity really necessary? What will it help us do? Does it mean we have to act on it? I mean, this is not acute leukemia, right? You have to have no disease if you're going to be cured of acute leukemia. We don't have to achieve that with a disease like CLL. We have that advantage. So how important is this to drive it down to really, really low levels? 
Uh, MRD assessment with novel therapies is dependent on the regimen, right? So a great example of that is Ibrutinib, the drug we have the longest experience with. Of course, we've used traditionally as continuous therapy. Uh, and you see mostly partial responses, not even complete responses by standard criteria, uh, much less MRD assessment, and yet you see this tremendous benefit. So I think having a discussion about MRD assessment on somebody on uh, BTK inhibitor therapy, continuous therapy, is really rather irrelevant. Um, however, it certainly may be useful with venetoclax combinations, for example, and I think it's really important if we're talking about time-limited therapies because it'll allow us to define which of those combinations will drive the response uh, deep, at least less than 10 to the minus 4, in a large proportion of patients, allowing us to consider stopping therapy. So at present, I think MRD assessment should be reserved for clinical trials. I think, in my view, the trials will tell us that with regimen A plus B given for X amount of time, we'll get 70% of patients MRD undetectable. So the message won't be measure MRD in patients who you're treating with that regimen. The message will be to clinicians, use those two drugs together for that amount of time and most of your patients are going to do quite well. Thank you. And here's a, I just included a list of abstracts for your interest having to do with CLL and uh, MRD.